So now that we've gone through some of the sort of facts on the ground, uh, I'm hoping you're a bit hungry for some frameworks for maybe digging into this material a little bit uh, more. I can't go into much detail in this talk, but what I can do is signal what's going to be appearing in the policy uh, document and provide some links to check things out further. So I'm going to talk about four different kinds of frameworks for understanding. The first would be the social media influence ecosphere framework. The second would be the social media ideological circuits framework. The third would be the social media shame cycles framework. And the fourth would be the social media risk assessment framework. So all of these start with um, a sort of a social science or behavioral science approach to the question of uh, misinformation. This is a terrific uh, article, if anybody wants to check it out, uh, called Using Social and Behavioral Sciences to Support pandemic response. And they talk about uh, how social scientists have long studied things like threat perception or risk behavior or um, communication or stress and coping. And uh, a lot of what I'm about to say draws from that way of looking at the world. So the first framework is the social media influence ecosphere. So I would define that as a framework for understanding how and why information with high emotional charge seems to dominate social media flows. It's useful for understanding dynamics like the spread of viral rumors online, especially among young people. So I'm about to move to a big chart that I don't have um, time to dig into at length, but I have done uh, an additional lecture on it if it's something that you would love to hear more about, and I will provide the link for that. So here you have the groovy dynamic here. You've got the influence ecosphere in the center, and it moves through social media actors, through events that get ticked off, to psychological states that become activated as a result of those events, to interface triggers that are built in, right, that, uh, that move, uh, that are designed to fire chemicals uh, like dopamine and cortisol, uh, that link to then social drivers like uh, offline, like gossip and rumors, online like shame cycles. Then we move into algorithmic tracking at the platform level, checking out the speed and the frequency and the language and the location of our interactions and finding the ones that seem to have the most, uh, what they call emotion on the move potential. Uh, at the platform level, what happens is certain kinds of interactions are dampened and certain kind of information uh, interactions are amplified as, in order to keep people online. The, uh, some of this is tied to flows like monetization. From here, we move to social media discourses about uh, these, these processes that seem social but actually are technosocial. So you'll see positive things like promoting and donating and protesting, and you'll see negative ones like drama and trolling and bullying. Right? And then finally, at the very end, we've got social media uh, practices that then map to these discourses. So uh, generally accepted, you know, using emojis or circulating memes, but contested if, if an image is too edited or if something feels like spam, right? So uh, that was a very quick and dirty tour, and again, uh, happy to share the longer lecture on that for anyone who is uh, curious. The next framework I want to talk to you about um, is uh, builds off existing work on what's called ideological health uh, cycles. I've uh, called this a social media uh, ideological circuit, and it is uh, designed to illustrate how social media technologies like personalization or customization or ratings wind up pooling users into communities of ideological self-reinforcement. I prefer the term pooling to terms like filter bubble because pools can be moved. Uh, bubbles are only popped. 
This is useful for understanding how things like conspiracy theories map to particular demographics online, and it can also be used to develop a plan for targeting different groups on the same platform. Before I go into the kind of circuit for you, I want to give you a, an on-the-ground example to have in your mind as we're going through this. So, on TikTok, here are two, there, there are, uh, there are different kinds of communities, right? So there's uh, what I would call um, following communities. You know, you follow somebody and then you see their stuff again. And then there are what I would call pooling communities. And those get generated by the different things, by algorithms that are tracking the different things you seem to like online. So, uh, there are many conversations. We're looking at the top, uh, the top left right now. Um, there are many conversations with young people online, and you might uh, have heard one with your kids about uh, straight versus alt TikTok. And straight doesn't necessarily mean heterosexual, although a lot of heterosexuals seem to wind up there. Um, straight is more like mainstream TikTok, and alt is more like alternative TikTok. And uh, the joke with kids is that you don't find alt TikTok, alt TikTok finds you. So if you're trying to research alt TikTok, you, there's no way to research it. What you have to do is start finding out about popular memes and popular trends that alt TikTok kind of likes and then keep following those and eventually you wind up in that pool. Um, I have this quote below, soon political parties won't exist in America and you will just have to identify as either straight or alt TikTok. I provide this because this is a way to think about how taste preferences wind up into ideological pooling. Um, there is, there are other kinds of taste preferences that may or may not map to ideological um, uh, preferences. This one I had to include, it's brand TikTok. So on TikTok, brands have official pages, but then there are all kinds of pages, unofficial pages that are done by accounts that are done by people who personify brands and talk through them. Uh, and I have the, for COVID, I have the one um, with the hand sign sanitizer saying, me trying to spell remember. Uh, there you go. So uh, now that we've taken a look at some sort of on the ground examples, let's take a look at how we might be able to map these phenomena. So here we have three overlapping circles. Uh, if we look at the top, we see my personal identity. And, you know, that would be typified by comments like, here are some things I like or dislike, or here's some values that are important to me, or here's how I determine right or wrong, or what's normal, or what's weird, or what's funny, or what's mean, right? My personal identity. Then we have, on the uh, purple side, we have a notion of social identity. And social identity has to do with, um, feeling included in your in-group, or acting in a way that's consistent with your social role within that group, or knowing how to distinguish your group from other out-groups. And then on the green part, we've got my social media preferences. And what you hear in this sort of area are comments like, this platform or channel or news source is what everybody uses. Because you've not been exposed to anything else because you've been algorithmically sorted by your taste preferences. Uh, you hear things like, this topic is something I should know about, uh, or alternately, something I don't need to know about. And then we have um, things like, well, in my group, nobody follows uh, this person or this, um, this source or nobody supports this, or nobody believes this. So this gives us a way to understand how, um, how taste begins to map to social identity, which then can begin to map to ideological 
position. And again, if the pools are not freshened, uh, they become stagnant. I wanted to include this very briefly, um, which sort of maps out this relationship to uh, ideological positions, social groupings, and uh, the next topic we're going to talk about, which is shame. So this maps out uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is generally described as, you know, thinking you know more than you do. And uh, it maps it in an interesting way to uh, imposter syndrome, which is maybe having information, but not feeling that you're in a position to be the group leader on that, uh, on that topic. And We've seen a fair amount of conversations about Dunning-Kruger, but not as many about the, the sort of flip-floppy dialectical relationship that young people are having uh, between the Dunning-Kruger effect and imposter syndrome, which I believe is, is, is guiding a lot of their choices about interacting online. So to build off that, I want to move into the framework called social media shame cycles. The, uh, I will say uh, shame is socially mediated and it is culturally um, ascribed. So I'm speaking in general terms and uh, your mileage may vary, as they say. So social uh, shame cycles are useful for understanding how personal and social stigma is communicated in online contexts. And it can be helpful to policymakers or platform owners or activists or educators or health practitioners when they're trying to think about interventions like dialogue or confrontation or education or care. So very quickly, uh, talking about the difference between shame and uh, other states like guilt. So shame is a self-conscious state and it has to do with feeling being out of place in a particular environment. And the desire that we have when we're experiencing shame is for relief. Ashamed people tend to isolate or avoid or they could also be uh, counterproductively angry and aggressive. They could be both at the same time. Guilt as opposed to shame, is uh, about action, usually about a desire for uh, reparation, and usually invo uh, involves things like apologies. So the way that I often describe the difference between shame and guilt to uh, students uh, is that uh, a person who feels guilty says, I can't believe I did that. And a person who feels ashamed says, I can't believe I did that, right? So. The, the latter is internalized. Blame is a form of language that's about condemnation, judging somebody as guilty. And it can be directed toward a person or a group or an object or a situation. And of course, we can also blame ourselves. Blaming and shaming generally has to do with emotions expressed by the person doing the blaming and shaming rather than the experience of guilt or shame itself. And that's an important thing to remember when we talk about the cycle that I'm going to illustrate for you. So here we go with a cycle. Uh, let's take the lower uh, right circle, which is blue. We'll start with shame. So again, we said this is an emotional state where you feel incompatible with a uh, current social environment. And the it exists on a continuum. So we can begin with words like awkward or weird, and we can wind up at the far end with words like remorseful or humiliated. Then we move to blame. So we move from a feeling that usually begins with I, I feel, to language that that makes us the object of somebody or something else, right? So uh, we can see at the very uh, lightest part uh, that person or thing infuriates me or annoys me. And at the furthest, we see things like, um, uh, oh, sorry, 
in the beginning we see frustrates me, frustrates me or annoys me, and then at the end we see things like makes me anxious or makes me furious, right? So we see kind of a, sh a language shift that moves from the subject to the object. Why does that matter? It matters because once you can make somebody or something an object, you can mediate it. You can turn reactions that um, that can be quite dangerous. So if you look into the red circle, you see some beginning uh, feelings like resentment or indecision about what we should do. And then you begin to see different levels of retaliation. And at the far end, you see things like cultural scapegoating and stigmatizing. There are uh, moves generally in social media cycles uh, to, to some sort of remediation. That would be the purple area. And uh, by that, um, we mean tactics that people are engaged in when they encounter uh, the red area. So they could ignore it, they could evade it, they could try to censor it, right? Um, they could launch a counterattack. At the, at the um, most open areas, we have reconciliation and restitution. Uh, but uh, what we want to focus on now is the, is the intervention area. So intervention, those are actions that are intended to prevent or alter the course of events, uh, ideally in early stages of expression, right? So examples would be dialogue or confrontation or education or care. Ideally, you want to be in those lighter bubbles of language when you uh, try to enter an intervention moment. So just to ground this, I want to give you some uh, shame-based examples uh, of interventions that that have gone on during COVID-19 with varying degrees of success. A shame, because of the social media shame cycle, shame is, is quite a dangerous uh, weapon to engage in. It might be extremely useful offline. It, it has a point of diminishing returns online. So the first is, uh, here are some generally offline examples. We have shame as punishment. We've got um, Indonesia shaming citizens for breaking quarantine, having them dig uh, graves. We've got some shaming that went on in Australian newspapers for young girls violating travel bans. Uh, we've got shame as stigma. We're seeing a lot of that around Islam and, of course, anti-China sentiment. Uh, We've got financial shame going on uh, that is stopping a lot of international students from being able to, to get help. We've got uh, essential worker financial shame, uh, realizing that um, unemployment is paying more than they're getting. In the area of COVID, we've got uh, kind of a long history of um, anti-vax shaming. Right, and here are some uh, memes that you can see online about that. And um, there's no doubt that COVID vaccines will enter into that uh, conversation. Uh, we certainly are seeing mask shaming. Now, this is something we should drill down on because this is a great example of how memes can um, intersect with shaming dynamics in ways we might not want. So on the left-hand side, we've got a pro-mask meme. Uh, on the middle, we've got an anti-mask meme. So we can tell that we've got, um, we've got folks on both sides of the aisle using these kinds of communication tactics. But look at the one on the far right. This one is, it starts out, if you look at the image, it says when you're the only one without a mask on in Walmart, right? And you're supposed to be the lion among the sheep. And uh, but on top of that, somebody has written, so that would be an anti-mask meme. But on top of that, somebody has written, this anti-mask meme is actually very accurate insofar as the lion is going to kill everything else in their picture, which signals that it's a pro-mask message. So when you start changing and overlaying commentary like this, uh, you can easily weaponize somebody else's message 
at, or have your own message weaponized against you. And that is something to keep in mind, especially when you're dealing with material that's about shame, because the shame cycle is always about offloading shame. The last thing I want to talk to you about for frameworks is a risk assessment matrix. So uh, this is something that might help explain how young people have learned to incorporate all the dynamics we've been talking about into self-perceptions of their emotional, economic, and physical risks online and off. It's useful for anyone working with young people's tendencies to narrate their experiences of trust and distrust through languages of authenticity. Referencing personal embodiment, so authentically feeling a certain way about something, and social mediation, that is deliberating the authenticity of others, right? Do they seem real? Do they seem genuine? Um, and also knowing that our own authenticity is also being assessed. So that shame cycle uh, I just showed you earlier, we saw this, um, this element of intervention. And uh, now we're going to really drill into the notion that to effectively intervene in anything, you have to gauge somebody's perceptions of trust and risk because nobody's going to tolerate an intervention if they don't trust the intervener and if they don't think the risk is, is worth it. So uh, I wanted to put this here first before the matrix because it is a way to think about how guilt and shame, um, they kind of differ depending on how you're thinking about them. And that in turn will, will affect how you intervene as, as uh, a practitioner, whether you are thinking about this from a psychological perspective or a developmental perspective or a sociological perspective, and that would be sort of more of a, a teaching perspective. So from the psychological perspective, some people's personalities are just more shame prone and others are more guilt prone. From a developmental perspective, that's on the left-hand side, individuals or group experiences with trauma can leave them more prone to shame. So if you've been stigmatized in the past, if you are uh, currently undergoing something like domestic violence in the home, uh, your propensity for shame reaction is heightened. Uh, and uh, and obviously, if you're in a situation like a, you know you're in a refugee camp, right? Uh, and then sociological perspective, which is on the right, socially dominant groups are more likely to experience guilt, and socially submissive groups are more likely to experience shame. Another way of saying that is if you're socially dominant, you assume that somebody's upset is over something you did. If you are socially subdominant, you assume somebody's upset is about who you are. So these are three different ways that we can think about how people are managing their emotional register. So here is a misc, uh, risk matrix. We have risk in the middle, and then we have these quadrants. If we start at the top, we've got esteem, right? Feeling good. We've got trust. We've got shame at the bottom, and we've got harm. Then you see these interior uh, kind of mechanisms that uh, happen over social media that move these emotional flows around. So between esteem and trust, we've got promotion. For between trust and shame, we've got redemption. From uh, shame to harm, we've got controversy. And between harm and esteem, we've got conversations about empowerment. So when we are sort of in the more positive section of things, uh, as, uh, authenticity tends to be assessed as an individual feeling, right? I feel empowered, or I feel good, or I feel, um, I feel uh, uh, seen. When we are talking about uh, more negative aspects, authenticity tends to be assessed as uh, a discourse. That is, uh, I don't think they're real. I don't think they're true. I don't think this is trustworthy. When we are at the top right of our sort of diamond here, social media as a whole, 
get spoken about as personally beneficial. It's a good thing. When we're at the bottom right, social media gets assessed as a whole as social as, as socially dangerous. It's not, it's not always a good place to be. When we are at the left-hand bottom, social media is assessed as publicly harmful. Bad things happen there. And then uh, at the top, when we move from harm to fighting back, to countermeasures, to revolution, uh, social media gets discussed as potentially transformative. The reason this is laid out the way it is, is because as a practitioner, you may want to take one of the outside clues to work toward the inside of the diamond. So if somebody's not telling you what's going on with them, but they're having these overarching conversations about how social media is dangerous, that could be giving you clues as to where they are in their own um, perception of risk and safety, and if they um, could use